If you haven't heard about Anger by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Let me explain. Anger has tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting at Anchor, you can distribute your podcast and listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcast, and more. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hey everyone, I'm Jim Ambusky and this is Conversations at the Washington Library. The Battle of Saratoga in September and October of 1777 was a decisive turning point in the American War for Independence. The American victory over the British in northern New York put a stopper to London's dreams of a swift end to the war and convinced the French to openly declare their support for the American rebels. It was, in the words of one American participant, a complete victory. Yet if we focus on the battles alone, we lose sight of the entire campaign, the colorful personalities on both sides who develop strategy, and the key role that geography played in shaping the choices that field commanders and civilian authorities made as their armies traversed forests, lakes, and rivers. On today's show, Dr. Kevin Weddle joins me to discuss his new book, The Complete Victory, Saratoga and the American Revolution, published by Oxford University Press in 2021. Weddle is a professor of military theory and strategy at the U.S. Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and he's a West Point graduate who retired as a colonel after 28 years of active service in the United States Army. And as you'll learn, the Battle of Saratoga was but one single turning point in a series of contingent moments that reshaped the course of the war. So fall in formation and let's win a complete victory at Saratoga with Dr. Kevin Weddle. Saratoga is one of those pivotal battles in the American Revolution. It's kind of one of those events that's fixed in our minds as a major turning point, which it is for ways we'll talk about, I'm sure. And your book, The Complete Victory, happens to be in one of my favorite series from Oxford University Press, Pivotal Moments in American History, this this series that looks at contingent moments in which there is a, a turning point a decisive turning point in the way that history plays out. But Saratoga often sort of gets that mention in the survey lecture at universities or in conversations as the Americans win this battle against the British or they they successfully prosecute this campaign against the British. It convinces the French to enter the war in 1778 with the Treaty of Alliance. And But I would imagine that we don't often take the time to look at the Saratoga campaign in its kind of totality, that it's it's an expansive campaign that lasts really, as I think, as you as you point out in your book, has its origins in 1776, when both sides are trying to figure out what they're going to do about the northern borderlands, how Canada fits into this equation, the centrality of Indian allies to both their respective positions. Geography, as it does with any military campaign, plays such a huge role. Kevin, I was wondering if you might sketch for our audience a kind of mental map of the northern borderlands of the American Revolution in this affordable moment as a way into the campaign in Gates versus Burgoyne and all the major players we'll be talking about today. That's a great way to start, Jim, because the terrain and the geography is probably some of the most beautiful and forbidding terrain in the eastern part of North America. You know, you got these beautiful lakes and rivers and creeks and mountains and hills and deep ravines and dense forests cut by roads that really at the time were little more than glorified, you know, cart paths. So you've, you've got, of course, the St. Lawrence River up in Canada. And then south of that, you've got Lake Champlain leading down almost like a dagger into New York. Uh, and then further south, of course, that will transition into the Hudson River Valley. And then out in the western part of New York, you've got, of course, the Mohawk River Valley that flows down to the Hudson River near Albany. So that's the area that we're talking about, hundreds and hundreds of square miles with very, you know, wilderness terrain that's very unlike that kind of terrain that you would find in Europe. And so Burgoyne's army, which consisted mainly of British regulars and many different types of soldiers, but primarily British regulars and German mercenary regular soldiers, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a shock because it's not something that they're, uh, they're used to. The distances are all also great. When you think about this campaign, uh, the distances play in many different ways. If you're just looking at it from a very large perspective, of course, the, the distance between London and North America, New York particularly, and Quebec, 
3,000 miles. And so that can take a long, long time to get messages back and forth. In fact, up to three months to get a message from London to New York and then get a reply back. So it can take up to three months. That's a big deal when you're trying to coordinate a campaign from where many of your decision makers are sitting there in London and other decision makers are sitting there in New York and Quebec. And then the distances, as you mentioned correctly, the distances within the campaign itself are very, very large. So if you're looking at, for instance, from the St. Lawrence River to the Saratoga battlefields, it's almost 200 miles. It's 300 miles from the battlefields near Philadelphia uh, to the battlefields of Saratoga. Uh, it's 280 miles from Canada to Fort Stanwix. And, and when you're in a, an era where you can only exchange messages as fast as a man could on a horse could travel, I mean, that's, that's going to play into this campaign as well. So all this unforgiving terrain is going to add many degrees of difficulty to what was already very complex plans. So things like movements, logistics, weather, obstacles, all those things are going to play in. And that particular summer that the campaign played out in, primarily, those five months of the campaign from June through October 1777, was a particularly wet summer. And so that's going to have an impact on how this campaign is fought and how the soldiers will deal with all these other different things. So the, the terrain, the, the weather, uh, the flora and fauna. I mean, you read, you read uh, accounts, especially by the, uh, the European soldiers, of these swarms of biting insects and rattlesnakes and things like that. They, they, it, it, was, it was quite an experience for them. And of course, it's affecting the American soldiers as well. But, but it, all those things are, are going to play into how this campaign will proceed. It sounds like a hellish nightmare, in, in both in our conversation here and in the book. Definitely the mosquitoes were one of the things that I was uh, paying close attention to, just you know, account after account of having to deal with this. And I think it was Burgoyne or one of his uh, lieutenants at some point mentioned that every person in the Army's face was just almost pockmarked with uh, with mosquito bites. And of course, there are rattlesnakes they've got to deal with as on top of the human elements. But both sides are very interested in this space. And, you know, if we're thinking about it right, Philadelphia seems like a more obvious target, which it is. General Howe, uh, William Howe, was very interested in taking Philadelphia. New York City, Charleston are obvious targets uh, and places right. that both sides either want to take or hold. But uh, almost immediately when the war begins, there is an invasion of Canada right. from the American side that General Sir Guy Carleton, who is in command up there, has to defend against. Why is it that the both sides are willing to risk running through this right. difficult terrain, these difficult environmental conditions in the months leading up to what becomes the Saratoga campaign? Right. When the Americans attempt to seize Quebec and seize that part of British Canada for the cause, they want to get the French Canadians to join the Americans against the British uh, in the rebellion. So they think that those would be natural allies for them. And so they want to seize Canada. From the British side, they're remembering back to the French and Indian War. They want to use that traditional invasion route to and from Canada that runs from the St. Lawrence River down Lake Champlain, actually up Lake Champlain, <laughs> since Lake Champlain flows <laughs> north, um, but, but basically south on Lake Champlain into the Hudson River Valley. And the British, the British have this notion in their heads that they think that if they conduct that kind of an operation and seize control of the Hudson River Valley, that they will split off the more rebellious New England colonies, ex-colonies, away from the, what they assume are the less rebellious middle and southern colonies. And by doing that, they can divide and conquer the American rebels. And they, they get that in their mind early on. They try it in 1776. Uh, Carleton is turned back after the Battle of Valcour Island on Lake Champlain. Uh, he's turned back with the winter coming on. He's forced to return back to Canada in um, early November of 1776. But they have it in their mind that they want to do this again, that this is the way to go. When Burgoyne presents his plan to uh, the king and Lord George Germain in London in late 1776, early 1777, where he's basically calling for a repeat of that attempt, uh, the 1776 attempt, only with 
uh, some more moving parts, a larger army. When he presents that plan, they fall in love with it and they really like it and they're going to go forward with that plan. But as I'm sure we'll get to later, it's going to lead to some other problems. <laughs> it doesn't go as well as they, they might hope. No, no. You had raised the issue of the communication difficulties. It's a little easier for obvious reasons in North America, in part because the distances are smaller. But formulating a strategy over 3,000 miles of ocean and then having to contend with the terrain we've talked about is a particular difficulty for the British. Who's actually formulating this strategy? How are politicians in London, like Lord George de Maine, formulating strategy in concert with the commanders on the ground, and how well does that go? Yeah, that's one of the things I think that sets my book apart a little bit from other books on Saratoga. I, I really do a deep dive into the strategy, especially the British strategy for 1777. And there are really four key players when it comes to the formulating the strategy for 1777. The king, uh, King George III, was intimately involved in working up the strategy, approving it, approving some personnel decisions. So he, he was a big player. Uh, then you also had Lord George Germain, which we've mentioned briefly. Lord George Germain was the uh, Secretary of State for the Colonies, cabinet member, key cabinet member. And one of his major responsibilities was managing the war in North America. Those are the two key politicians, we call the king a politician. And then the military leaders, of course, you had Burgoyne, uh, Lieutenant General John Burgoyne, who was Carleton's second in command during the, the board of 1776 invasion south on Lake Champlain. So he had returned home to London and he presents his plan for this very ambitious um, strategy, which I'll get into in a second. Those three decision makers, those three senior leaders are sitting there in London in late 1776, early 1777. And then the commander in chief in North America, General Sir William Howe, is sitting in his headquarters in New York. So they're 3,000 miles away. So you have the commander in chief sitting there in New York and these other senior leaders sitting there in London trying to come up with this strategy. So it's hard to coordinate a strategy when, again, a message and its response could take three months. Uh, to get back and forth. But that's what they're going to try to do here in early 1777. So Burgoyne presents his plan. His plan is very ambitious. It's very complex. It's going to call for uh, the main army in Canada to go south on Lake Champlain, seize Fort Ticonderoga, continue south, gaining strength and support from loyalists as they go, and moving all the way down to uh, Albany. Another column uh, a smaller column, this is a supporting column, would go down the St. Lawrence River to uh, Lake Ontario, down to Oswego, New York, and then across country to the Mohawk River, and then following the Mohawk River Valley all the way down to Albany. Their mission was to basically divert attention away from the main body uh, to make sure that it could get to Albany. But that column would also meet with the main body at Albany. And then uh, Howe's main army in New York would come up the Hudson River. And all of the, these three columns would ultimately come together in uh, Albany, and then they would conduct some sort of future offensive operations, ill-defined at the time. So the king loved it. Germain loved it. They really thought it was a war winner. At the same time, Howe, who, remember, I mean, he has chased Washington across New Jersey and across the Delaware River. He's had to deal with uh, Washington striking back at Trenton and Princeton in late 1776, early 1777. So he proposes his own plan. His plan calls for seizing, it goes through several iterations, but his final plan calls for seizing Philadelphia, the quasi-American capital, that's at least where the Congress is sitting, of course, seize Philadelphia, he assumes that Washington and his main army is going to have to defend Philadelphia. That's what he would do, probably. So he assumes Washington would do the same thing. And then in that way, he can get Washington where he wants him, destroy Washington's main army, and therefore end the rebellion. Because by this time, Howe has, Howe's pretty much figured out that the, the center of gravity of the American Revolution is Washington and his army. In that respect, I think Howe is correct. I think he is 
he has made the correct strategic assessment of, of where this revolution was going. So that's his plan. So it's up to Germain to take those two plans and either pick one and go with it or somehow coordinate these two plans. Unfortunately for the British, that doesn't happen. What ends up happening is a, a muddled, uncoordinated sort of dual strategy where Germain says, okay, Burgoyne, your plan is approved. Uh, how? Your plan is approved too, but as soon as you finish that Philadelphia operation, I want you to go help Burgoyne, which because those messages going back and forth, I have this detailed appendix in the book where I try to follow all these orders and letters going back back and forth across the ocean where you can sort of follow the breadcrumbs as to you can you can sort of watch the strategy falling apart so how for example gets a message saying oh your plan is approved you can go to philadelphia so okay so he's on his way to philadelphia on his way there he gets the word that okay once you finish philadelphia you need to go help for going and you know he's right in the middle of the philadelphia campaign hey, in fact he hasn't even arrived yet because he's going by sea Clearly, the folks in London really don't understand those distances we talked about. They don't understand the reality of campaigning in America. And who knows how long the Philadelphia campaign is going to take. Howe understands that. He gets this message to say, you know, once you're done, go help Burgoyne. And he's like, I'm not going to be able to help Burgoyne. You got to be kidding me. It ends up being this very uncoordinated sort of dual strategy and as it turns out, you know, neither one of them are going to work. When you look at what happens in the Saratoga campaign, which as we all know, the Saratoga campaign is going to culminate in those final two battles of Saratoga in uh, September and early October of 1777. The seeds for that British disaster are sowed in London in early 1777. Everything that comes out of this campaign is going to happen mainly because of this muddled, uncoordinated strategy. One of the things I really liked about your book is you really show how, in many real respects, either these gentlemen, Germain, Burgoyne, Howe, whatnot, Carlton, either are not listening to each other or are not paying attention, or they're making assumptions that when, uh, for instance, Burgoyne knows that a letter has been sent to Howe, there's the implication that Howe should then link up with Burgoyne along the Hudson River, but not really an explicit order to do so. And as you say, a lot of the seeds for that failure are sowed in London. I want us to talk a little bit about Lord George Germain, because he's always been a fascinating figure to me. And I didn't know as much about him as I would have liked to, even though I've read other things about him before, but I've always known him as in the context of the Secretary of the Colonies and as at the head of the war. But he actually has extensive military background itself which uh, I think has not often been explored in great detail when we're thinking about these things. But in your book, you suggest that his, uh, shall we say, lack of uh, honorable reputation in that head <laughs> and his service on the European continent during the Seven Years' War creates a lot of mistrust between Germain and his military subordinates in ways that cause them to question his soundness, but also creates frustration on his part because he wants to be the guy in charge, but he's always got the Battle of Minden hanging over his head. Right. Right. He's a fascinating character. I, I agree. I think a, a new biography of him would be really useful. But yes, he has extensive military experience. He's a former general officer. Uh, he served with great distinction up to Minden in the Seven Years' War. After Minden, when he's accused of disobeying orders and almost cowardice, he, of course, his reputation goes down the tubes, and he's later rehabilitated because he is a very capable guy. I mean, he's very, very smart. He's got incredible energy. One of these guys you probably wouldn't want to work for because he's constantly in the office and he's constantly working. This dynamo kind of thing. But his problems with his relationship with a lot of these senior officers who will serve in the Saratoga campaign is not only his bad reputation that he got from the Seven Years' War, but also, I mean, he's very, very abrupt. He's very brusque. He does not, you know, does not dole out praise. Uh, he's um, very, 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 very demanding. 
And so he really rubs a lot of these senior officers the wrong way. A perfect example of that is his relationship with General Sir Guy Carlton. Carlton does really a brilliant job defending Canada from the American invasion in late 1776 and then into 1777. He does a great job with very, very few resources. And, you know, when word gets back to Germain describing what Carlton did, all he can do is complain. Well, you didn't do enough. And so Carlton's sitting there in Quebec getting these messages from Germain saying, why didn't you do this, that, and the other thing? <laughs> Carlton's going, geez, you, you know, come on. I just, I saved Canada for you. And uh, all you can do is nitpick. I talk a little bit about it in the book, but they started exchanging these, these, I was about to say emails. They started exchanging <laughs> these, these letters uh, back and forth that are just, you know, you read them today and you go, oh my God, I can't believe this is a, you know, this is a senior officer sending that kind of a note to his, you know, civilian superior, but really nasty, you know, letters uh, flying back and forth. So their relationship just collapses. And he has a similar relationship with Howe. Their relationship will deteriorate after a while. He gets along pretty well with Burgoyne until toward the end of the campaign when Burgoyne starts blaming a lot of what happens to him on Germain. And he has a really hard time whenever he has to testify or speak in Parliament because he is pretty much despised uh, in Parliament, especially, of course, by the Whig opposition. So, so Germain has sort of a tough, tough time. The king really likes him. He's because Germain is loyal. One of the things about King George, very, very loyal guy, because Germain is very loyal back to the king. He's probably going to keep Germain on longer than he than the king probably should have. That's going to be a problem, despite his his obvious talents. His relationship with these senior officers is going to be very toxic after a while. How have other historians looked at this question of the Saratoga campaign and its significance beyond simply, of course, that for the American side, it, it leads to the French entry into the war? What have other historians said about this conflict? You know, there's been some really great books on Saratoga, but they, they tended to focus on the final two battles. In some ways, that makes sense. I mean, they're, that's the sort of the sexy part of the campaign, those two big battles at the end. I talk about those two big battles too, but but when you look at the the campaign in its entirety, again, about five months, many, many moving parts. There's 12 battles and engagements that take place during this campaign. There are sieges, there are river crossings, there are all sorts of very complex military operations taking place, not to mention even the things that are happening in the rest of North America that will have a huge impact on what happens in Saratoga, for instance, the Philadelphia campaign. And so I tried to look at the campaign in its entirety. And so I spent a lot of time talking about Fort Stanwix and the Battle of Oriskany, as an example. Frankly, most historians who talk about Saratoga, they'll cover that in a couple of pages and then move on. Uh, I think they were all very, very important. So all of these are, all of these Moving parts, I think you have to try to make sense of, of the entire campaign to get a real feel for why it was so important. And then, of course, the, the impact at the end, there's multiple impacts. It wasn't just the treaty and the formal alliance with France. I want to ask then about your own service as an officer in the United States Army, and you've done a couple of military deployments, and you teach now at the Army War College. Can you tell us a little bit about how your own service helped you have a more holistic sense of the Saratoga campaign from you know that big 30,000 foot picture too, as you describe in the book, trying to find, at least from the British, trying to find enough carts so that they can carry everything down right. Lake Champagne right. and there, or, or carry up Lake Cham, Champlain, excuse me. I had to get used to that. I, I had forgotten that. Which <laughs> it took me a long time to get used to it yeah, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but how has how has your own service informed your thinking about this as you evaluated yeah. what yeah. both sides are doing? At uh, first, I would say you know you you don't have to have military experience to be a, a good military historian. I mean, all we have to do is look at people like uh, <laughs> you know Rick Atkinson and Bruce Catton and Jim McPherson and David Hackett Fisher and Victor Davis Hansen and Craig Simons. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Brilliant military historians who have had no military experience. You know, I I served 
almost 29 years on active duty, you know, battalion command. I was brigade command select. I served at the Pentagon, you know, high, high positions, low position. You know, one of the things that I think is helpful, though, to have some military experiences, I certainly know what it's like to be tired, wet, hungry, you know, with a big pack on your back and, and tromping through the forest. Uh, I certainly know how that goes. I lived Clausewitz's famous statement about war, that everything in war is simple, but even the simplest thing is very, very difficult in war. I certainly live that. And when you're talking about logistics, when a lot of people think logistics, they think supplies and stuff. But as you mentioned properly, you know, logistics is a lot more than just supplies and stuff. It's transporting it. It's getting it to where it needs to be. It's maintenance. It's uh, fuel. In this case, you know, fuel for a, an 18th century army is fodder for your animals. You have to make sure you have that, not just feeding your soldiers, but your animals as well. Uh, and all those different things play into that. And I, I think the other thing that's helped me is leading staff rides and battlefield tours. I've led probably hundreds and hundreds of staff rides and battlefield tours to places like Gettysburg and Antietam and Normandy, Gallipoli, Sicily, Waterloo, all sorts of places in Europe and the United States. So that in itself, I think, is uh, has been helpful. You know, I was a combat engineer for my career and combat engineers have to understand terrain. We're the guys that a commander will turn to and say, you got to pick the right place for us to set up our defensive positions or whatever. Uh, you have to understand terrain. And so I, I think that's helped me in the book, trying to describe terrain and describe defensive positions or fortifications or whatever. So I, th I think that sort of thing has, has helped inform my, uh, my research and writing. Well, let's turn to the terrain and the fortifications. I do want to get to the American side of the equation here in just a moment, but places like Crown Point, places like Fort Ticonderoga and the surrounding hills are critical to this campaign and, and the objectives that particularly Burgoyne wants to take and the Americans have to defend. And we started our conversation with the more 30,000 foot view of the geography, but let's zoom in now for a second and look at these key places. What is at stake? What the Americans have to defend? What the British have to take? What's going on in those two key places? Well, a lot of these key fortifications, key defensive positions were developed during the French and Indian War, and in some cases, actually, even before that, because even dating back to Champlain's time, they had recognized the importance of that Lake Champlain Hudson River corridor, and then also the Mohawk River corridor as well as being really key. So in the French and Indian War, the French and the British had constructed fortifications at, at key points. By the time of the American Revolution, those became important again. The key fortifications really were, were Fort Ticonderoga because that guarded the Lake Champlain, Lake George connection there right down into the Hudson River Valley. That was critical. So Fort Ticonderoga protected that gateway to the rest of North America. And Fort Stanwix guarded the approaches to the Mohawk River Valley. So those were the, the two big ones. And then, of course, south of Ticonderoga, there's a series of other fortifications, most of them in very poor repair. Uh, Fort Edward, Fort Miller, uh, Fort George, little more than some rotten palisades. Fort Stanwix was a little bit more substantial, and the Americans had spent a lot of time and effort in the months before this campaign in repairing it and getting it back up to speed. So by the time the, the British arrive, Fort Stanwix is in fairly decent uh, shape. So both, you know, the Americans will work very hard to try to uh, prepare these fortifications for an invasion that they pretty much expect is going to happen sometime in 1777 after what had happened in 1776. So the Americans are working hard. They do a really good job at Stanwix. Uh, they do a less good job at uh, Ticonderoga. Uh, mainly because of the leadership there, there's major problems with the American command and control of the Northern, uh, the Northern Army. Uh, really, there's two major American armies. There, there's some smaller ones scattered about, but the two major American armies are the one under Washington in New Jersey, Pennsylvania area. And then up in the north of Albany, there's the Northern Department. The other major American army is up there. In the, in the spring and early summer of 1777, the Americans have a, a major command and control issue uh, with the Northern Department. Uh, General Schuyler was in command up there. 
he basically leaves his command, goes to Philadelphia. He's trying to restore his reputation that had been tarnished during the 1776 campaign. He basically leaves his command uh, without permission and without anybody to take over. General Gates, Horatio Gates, has been sent up there to take command of Ticonderoga for Ticonderoga. But instead, he shows up at Albany. Schuyler's gone. And he goes, well, I'll, I'm going to take command. You know, who is really in command of the Northern Department? And with all of that, those political issues kind of floating about, Ticonderoga is not given the sort of tender, loving care that a senior commander should be giving it uh, during that time. And so Ticonderoga is not ready to go when when Burgoyne gets there. I almost had to laugh, or I guess not laugh would be the right emotion, but as uh, I was reading up to the eventual fall of Ticonderoga and the American officers in, at the fort are repeatedly riding back to Albany uh, for some senior commander to, you know, Gates or whatnot to please come up and take up position here because we've, uh, we need some senior leadership if we're going to be able to effectively coordinate our defenses. I mean, to us, our eyes, it looks very petty, a sort of infighting amongst American commanders who are going back to Philadelphia and Gates in particular. I wonder if you would talk about Gates and his personality and his uh, both his dissatisfaction with what's going on in what is uh, called the Northern Department to this Northern Army and his relationship with Washington, how he feels that he's not being adequately supplied and, and he's uh, in a sense being set up to failure and he, he goes to Philadelphia to state his case. It's interesting because all of these three key American commanders, so George Washington, the commander of chief, of course, Schuyler, the commander of the Northern Department, and then Horatio Gates, the wannabe commander of the Northern Department, all got along really well early on in the war. Washington and Schuyler, of course, are Americans, uh, American born and raised. Gates is a former British officer who serves in, in America during the French and Indian War and then you know, marries an American girl, becomes an American. And when the revolution takes place, he jumps right in and volunteers his skills. He serves very well early in the war, but he and Washington start having some conflicts. And after a while, Gates begins to think that he is a lot more talented than Washington is. And he's, uh, he starts lobbying for independent command. Now, in the 1776 campaign, he commands at Fort Ticonderoga, does a good job up there. Benedict Arnold serves under him in that in that campaign. They get along great. And he does a nice job. So he thinks that, you know, then he deserves a, a senior command. When Congress sends him up to take command of Ticonderoga in the spring of 1777, and Schuyler is not there at Albany, he takes it upon himself to take command of the entire department because he thinks... Just commanding a Ticonderoga is beneath him by this point. When he's in sort of nominal command of the Northern Department, he's sending messages back and forth to uh, Washington and doesn't think he doesn't think that Washington is supporting him properly. Washington, I think, correctly is doing everything he possibly can to help Gates. Uh, it's important to remember, of course, that Washington is commander in chief of the entire American military establishment, not just his army. I spent a lot of time in the book talking about Washington's central role in the Saratoga campaign. I think that's one of the things that also differentiates my book. And I compare and contrast his role as commander in chief with Howe as commander in chief. And it's very, very different how they approach those two positions. By the time we get to the spring of 1777, the relationship between Gates and Schuyler is fraying, and the relationship between Gates and Washington is fraying. And that's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Now, with this muddled American command and control in the Northern Army, Washington, this is one area that I do criticize Washington for, he doesn't really step in and resolve the problem. You know, who is really in command of the Northern Department? And neither does Congress. Congress finally will. They finally resolve it and say, no, Schuyler, you are in command of the Northern Department. Gates you can either command at Ticonderoga or we'll find something else for you to do. And that's when Gates, uh, in a huff, you know, rushes off to Philadelphia and, and basically yells at Congress uh, for a, an interesting chapter in Gates's uh, history, I think, troubled history. But Gates, of course, will ultimately end up being the victory of Saratoga at the end. 
One of the concepts you introduce early on in the book that carries through all the way through is, uh, I believe it comes from Field Marshal Montgomery, the British commander in the Second World War, this idea of grip. Could you tell us what you mean by grip and how you think it applies or does not apply to some of the personalities here we've been talking about? The course I teach here at the Army War College is about military strategy. And so I, I have my students do a World War II case study looking at how allies, how the allies formulated strategy in the European theater. So as part of that, I was doing some reading on, on Montgomery and, you know, I thought I was pretty well read on the subject, but I had really never encountered his idea of grip. And this was a Bernard Montgomery Monty uh, notion of grip when it comes to leadership. He loved commanders with grip. And what, what he meant was he wanted his subordinate commanders to understand all the aspects of their unit, where it was exactly understanding the logistical situation, you know, how many rounds of ammunition they had on hand, how many tons of supplies, how many gallons of fuel, you know, all these sort of nitty gritty kind of things he wanted his commanders to have a good handle on. And a commander who had a handle on that sort of thing had grip. And so Monty really liked that. So it's sort of a tactical kind of uh, administrative sort of thing. Uh, now, to me, as I read that, I thought, well, really, that's what every commander should have. You know, every commander should know those things about his unit. So I thought, well, you know, what if I took Monty's notion of grip and sort of expanded it to look at some more intangible things uh, that a commander should have? Closer to what Clausewitz, the great Prussian military theorist, called genius. And that would be a commander who, who is able to function without having complete information. A commander who can make decisions based on his judgment and his experience. And a commander who's able to sort of envision how a campaign will unfold. A commander who can make a battlefield decision or an operational decision or a strategic decision based on, again, limited information, but on that commander's experience and, and intuition. My notion of grip can be applied at the tactical level, the operational level, and the strategic level. So I tried not to make a huge deal out of it, but as the campaign played out, I tried to look at how these different commanders dealt with some of these, these situations. And the conclusion I came to was really at the colonel level on down, both sides were blessed with really good commanders, I think. You know, commanders who led from the front, who took care of their troops who were personally brave, who made sure that their troops were well taken care of and, and ready to go when it came time to, uh, to fight. But at the senior levels, the more senior levels, I found that really the Americans had a better grip when it came to how they conducted their military operations. And I, you know, I can name several, I, you know, certainly Howe versus Washington. Uh, I think Washington certainly had a better grip on the strategic situation than Howe did. And certainly I think at the more operational or military strategic level, I think Gates had a better grip on the situation than did Burgoyne, certainly. So I think there's really two major threads that work themselves through the book. Uh, one is strategy that we already talked about, and the other is leadership, uh, and grip was a part of that leadership. No, it was really fascinating. And uh, one of the things, the observations you make is a part of the problem on the British perspective is they can't see past Fort Ticonderoga. They can't see past once they make that junction with Howe and they and they bisect the colonies. Well, what comes next? It seems like they just expect that the war is going to end, that the loyalists in the South will come out in droves or they'll come out of the of woodwork and that they'll slowly constrain and defeat the more rebellious New England colonies. And that's the ball game. But it doesn't turn out that way. <laughs> no, Jim, you, you make a really good point because part of the problem with their strategy is they made assumptions and there's nothing wrong with making assumptions. I mean, today, even today, when we do military planning, making assumptions is part of it because you don't have perfect information. Nobody does. Right. And when they when they made these plans, they didn't have perfect information. But when you make a plan based on critical assumptions, and, and the two, I think, most critical assumptions for Burgoyne was that the loyalists would come out in droves to support him uh, as he moved into New York. And number two, that he would get this huge number of Native Americans that would actively support his operation. 
neither one of those assumptions turned out to be correct. So when you make an assumption and your plan is based on those assumptions, you have to at least think through, okay, what if that assumption doesn't pan out? How am I going to mitigate that problem if that assumption doesn't turn out to be true? And none of these senior commanders on the British side did that. Why is Saratoga, as you, as the title of your book suggests, why is it a complete victory or the complete victory as it comes from the primary source you took it from? One thing about the title, you know, the, just about every Saratoga book you'll ever run into has some sort of turning point or Saratoga, the tipping point or tipping point, the Saratoga or Saratoga or turning point, the, you know, some sort of turning point, tipping point, whatever. And I wanted to avoid that. And so when I came across this, this wonderful letter written by General Nixon, who was there at fighting at Saratoga, and he writes his wife two days, one day after the surrender of Burgoyne's army, you know, he says it was the complete victor. I said, oh my God, that's, that's a, a perfect title. Luckily, my, my editor agreed. When you look at the impact of Saratoga, there's really kind of a short-term impact and the long-term impact. The short-term impact, of course, there's only two major British armies in North America. They've just lost one, lost one completely. They've just lost 6,000 men. You know, today, you know, that would be considered a brigade size unit, not super big. But back then, that was a big army. That was a good size army. So you lose 6,000 men, that's a huge deal for the British. They only had two armies, they've just lost one. Morale, of course, morale at American side, it soars. And the British side, of course, it sinks. For the British, not only is foreign intervention possible, it's now probable. Uh, opposition in Parliament is emboldened, the Whig opposition and anti-war opposition in Parliament. Now the British have to plan for homeland defense, which they really didn't have to worry about before. Now they do. Uh, now they have to look at potentially a wider war. And they have now this, is it still possible to achieve a political settlement uh, with the Americans? Maybe not now. Uh, so that's going to be a problem they're going to have to deal with as well. Long-term implications are the obvious ones. It's going to jumpstart the American diplomatic effort in Paris, which will ultimately lead just weeks after Saratoga will lead to the, the signing on the uh, 6th of February of, of 1778, the Treaty of Amity and Commerce and the Treaty of Alliance with France. Now France is overtly on our side will lead to, of course, us having the benefit of French sea power and ultimately, of course, uh, their land power as well, although it's going to take some time. And, you know, working with the French is going to be difficult. They're, they turn out to be difficult allies, like most alliances are going to have some teething problems and, and issues. And that's going to be the same with us in France. But of course, ultimately, we know in 1781, the final American victory will be achieved with French sea power and a French army. It's going to lead to a, a complete upheaval of British military strategy. They'll ultimately embark on the so-called Southern strategy late in 1778, all because of what happens at Saratoga. So Saratoga has multiple far-reaching impacts beyond just the, the French alliance. More conversations after the break. If you want to learn more about the presidency from George Washington to Joe Biden, well, let me tell you about the podcast series, The Past, The Promise, The Presidency, from the Center of Presidential History at Southern Methodist University. Now, I did not know Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was not a friend of mine, but the folks who run this show are, and they do a terrific job of unpacking the presidency's impact on American politics and society. So check out their latest season as they take a deeper dive into the president and the bully pulpit and explore the president's ability to tackle any issue from foreign policy to health care to influence American culture, policy, and the world beyond. Season three of The Past, The Promise, The Presidency is out now. Be sure to catch up on past seasons and learn more about the program by going to www.pastpromisepresidency.com. And now back to the 18th century. Kevin, what book are you reading right now? Uh, something a little bit different. I'm reading uh, Operation Pedestal by Max Hastings. Uh, it's a book about the British uh, naval attempt to relieve basically the air siege of Malta in uh, 1942. Who's the author you most admire? Oh, boy, there's there's so many. Jim, I, I can't pick one, but I have several that I, I really, really enjoy. Uh, David Hackett Fisher is one of them. My PhD mentor at Princeton, Jim McPherson, I 
read anything Jim writes. Andrew Roberts is a is a good friend and a great author. Love his uh, Churchill book um, and just getting into the George the Third and that's that's outstanding. I am a huge Winston Churchill fan, not just of of the man, but of his writings as well. I'm rereading his uh, River War right now too. So. Uh, I've, I've got a lot. <laughs> There's really no, why well, I, I can't pick just one. Yeah. I always like that question because n- nobody could ever just pick just one. It's, no, it's really no, hard. it's impossible. Yeah. What is the most exciting document you've ever found in your research? Um, I, I guess if we're looking at the Saratoga campaign, because of my interest in strategy, it was the letter that General Howe wrote to General Carlton on the 5th of April, 1777, uh, in which he says, um, hey, I know you guys are expecting me to come up the Hudson River to join whoever, because at that time he didn't know who was commanding the army from Canada. I guess he, he probably assumed it was going to be Carlton, but he said to meet you at Albany. Well, I'm not going to be able to meet you at Albany because I'm heading to Philadelphia. And, you know, it's not as if, I mean, I didn't discover that letter. I mean, other historians have seen that letter, but I don't think, I don't think historians have, have, have realized how important that letter is. I think that is a critical letter. It showed that how clearly was going to Philadelphia and that Burgoyne and Carlton up in Canada knew how was going in to Philadelphia, and yet they embarked on that campaign anyway, uh, because they made that fatal assumption that, well, yeah, but he'll get orders later on to join us at Albany, instead of trying to verify (laughs) that that was the fact. They just blithely continued on. And I think it also showed that Burgoyne, even though he had that letter and he continues on, even after the battle of the disastrous Battle of Bennington, I think it showed that Burgoyne just had this overconfidence and hubris that he was going to be able to pull it out anyway, no matter, even though things were going going south on him. How do you hope people remember your work? Well, first and foremost, I mean, I, I hope they enjoy it. That's the main thing. I hope they enjoy it. I hope they don't think it's a slog. <laughs> um, I hope they think that the book makes sense out of a very complex campaign. I hope they they enjoyed the the personalities because I think they're you know, the, the personalities involved are as interesting as any you'll ever find uh, in a historical event. You know, obviously, it'll be surpassed someday, but I, I hope down the roads, people will feel that it's, you know, really kind of the authoritative, most comprehensive account of Saratoga, at least to date. Uh, all good goals, and I think you're well on your way to achieving those, certainly. So, Kevin, thank you very much. This has been a fun book to read and a fun conversation. Well, thanks, Jim. I, I really, really enjoyed it. And thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening to Conversations, a production of the Center for Digital History at the Washington Library. I'm Jim Ambusky, your host and producer for this episode. We received additional support from Mount Vernon's Media and Communications Department. Our music is Witch's Brew by C.K. Martin. Now, before we go, please do us a favor and rate and review Conversations on your favorite podcast app. It helps others find the show and lets us know what you're learning about our early American past. And be sure to head over to our website at www.georgewashingtonpodcast.com to find more great episodes. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.